Is depression becoming more common? Bouts of depression, now the rate anxiety, has continued depression to climb. And anxiety. Isolation. Five percent increase. It's an unfortunate truth that mental health problems are on the rise. Depression, anxiety, stress, overwhelm are all getting worse across the board. And the economic uncertainty and social isolation that we've all experienced doesn't help either. Suicide is Mental the 10th health. leading cause uh, with of Omicron death. Now patients dying. Millions more in the Federal Reserve. As someone who's struggled with depression since my teens, I know how debilitating mental health issues like this can be. And that's why I've been making this series of videos to document my own process of overcoming depression and rebuilding myself. One of the problems with mental health issues like depression, anxiety, stress, burnout, and so on, is that when you're in such a state, when you're in this negative state, you want nothing more than to get better. You want nothing more than to get out. But at the same time, you have no energy to do anything. And also everything feels futile and pointless. So you can't get yourself to do things that might help you actually improve. Today, I want to share with you something that has helped me deal with this specific problem. And I call this trust the process. If the starting condition is you feel terrible, you want to get better, but you have zero energy to do anything to get better. You have zero motivation to do anything. You can barely get yourself out of bed. What do you do? Well, for me, I respond well to evidence and I respond better to more evidence. So what I tend to seek is find ways to give myself overwhelming evidence of things that can help me improve my state. And here's the good news. You don't have to reinvent the wheel you know that there are certain things you can do that would make you feel even worse. And you know that there are certain things you can do that would help even if only a little. You can rely on all the research that's done, all the work that other people have done to find out what affects mental health positively and negatively and simply choose what works best. Here's an example of what I mean. Let's talk about exercise. Many studies over many years have shown that exercise has loads and loads of benefit. It obviously makes you healthier, it's good for your heart health, it's good for your endurance and strength and so on, but it's also shown to improve mood, to improve sleep, to improve motivation. There's basically a long list of benefits that come with exercise and many of those benefits are mental health benefits. Now, I'm sure you've heard this before. I'm sure this is not news to you, but it's one thing for someone to just tell you, hey, exercise is good for mental health, or maybe you read a headline about it or something. It's another thing to really give yourself overwhelming evidence that this thing can help you. And if we dig into the research, we can indeed find overwhelming evidence. For example, a large study conducted in 2007 showed that exercise can be as effective, sometimes even more effective than prescription medication for depression and anxiety. And it doesn't even seem to matter much what type of exercise you do exactly. You know, whether you do high intensity training or you just go for a brisk walk, any kind of exercise seems to have an immediate and measurable impact on people's mental health, including people who are suffering from severe mental health problems. There's also a huge body of research that shows how exercise benefits the brain and is just incredibly good for brain health in general. So it stands to reason that, you know, a healthier brain is going to be a less depressed, less stressed, less anxious brain. Now I could go on and on, but you see where this is going. The more evidence you have, the more you can believe that this isn't just some anecdote that maybe is helpful for someone else. And the more you can believe that, no, this is actually something that can make a significant difference, even for me, even in a state that feels hopeless. The more evidence like this I see, the easier it is for me to trust the process, to get myself to do a little bit of exercise, even if I feel like absolute crap, and to trust that it is helping, even if I can't immediately notice any benefits. And to further take this up a notch, what I do is read books. If I read an entire book with evidence that something helps me, I really end up believing it. And again, that just makes it much easier for me to take action. So for the connection between exercise and mental health, a book I can recommend is Spark by John Ratty. That's the basic idea behind trust the process. You can feed yourself evidence that there are things you can do that will make a difference. And the more evidence you have, the more you can trust that this will work, even if it's not immediately apparent.
And I've done this basically over a broad range of things. So let me briefly share with you some of the most effective, most evidence-based things I've found that help with mental health issues. Let's talk about sleep. Sleep is similar to exercise in some ways, in that it is just generally really good for brain health to get enough sleep, and it is terrible for brain health and basically everything related to your cognitive abilities to not get enough sleep. One of the best ways to sabotage your mental abilities is to be sleep deprived. Mental health issues and sleep disorders often go hand in hand in basically a self-reinforcing cycle. So the worse you feel, the less you take care to have a good sleep hygiene, to have good sleep habits, you maybe stay up too late, you sleep in, all kinds of stuff, you'd end up not getting enough sleep or oversleeping. And this lack of healthy sleep makes your mental health worse and that makes your sleep habits worse and so on and so forth. If you want to get an overwhelming amount of evidence that sleep can help you with your mental health issues, the book I recommend is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. What you can do in practice is, no matter how bad you feel, stick to a sleep schedule. Because getting too little sleep is obviously bad for you, leads to sleep deprivation and all kinds of health issues. But another typical problem that you might have when you're suffering from mental health problems is that you can't get yourself out of bed in the morning and that you just end up spending too much time in bed, maybe half asleep, half awake. And that's not good for you either. So you can trust that if you stick to a sleep schedule where you know if I go to bed by this time and I wake up by this time, I have enough time in bed to get the right amount of sleep, not too little, not too much, and you stick to that, you wake up when the alarm rings, you get into the habit of never hitting snooze, then even though that can be difficult to begin with, it's one of those things where you can trust that the more you do that, the better your brain health gets. The next tool worth mentioning is gratitude. In the field of positive psychology, lots and lots of studies have been done on the connection between gratitude and happiness. And these studies show lots of evidence that many different forms of gratitude practice of expressing gratitude or writing about gratitude have immediate and measurable effects to people's mood and to people's happiness levels overall. Even a short gratitude journaling session can make a measurable difference. If you want to feed yourself some overwhelming evidence on this topic, the books I recommend are Learned Optimism and Authentic Happiness by Martin Seligman. Next up, social connection. The Harvard study of adult development is one of the longest running studies in the world. It's been going on for over 80 years now and has tracked life outcomes of its subjects over an entire lifetime. One of the things that this study shows most clearly is that there are few things more important for well-being, health and happiness than social connection. And this is just one of many studies that shows that social connection is very tightly connected to not only mental health, but even physical health and longevity. Just like with the sleep problem we mentioned before, we often see a self-reinforcing vicious cycle where you become more socially isolated because you're depressed and your social isolation makes you more depressed, which makes you more isolated and so on. Breaking that even in a small way reaching out to a friend, reaching out to someone you can talk to can make a difference. And there's all this evidence that you can trust so that even if it feels pointless, it is still worth doing. A great book to explore this topic and feed yourself more evidence that this works is Lost Connections by Johan Hari. Next, let's talk about meditation. Of course, we have to talk about meditation because it has become all the rage as a way to manage stress and anxiety. And it's often advertised as mainly a solution for mild kind of mental health issues. So the question is, does it work? Does the evidence support this idea? And once again, with meditation, it is well studied and we can find a large body of evidence that shows positive mental health benefits that come with different forms of meditation. The ones that have mainly been studied are mindfulness meditation and loving kindness or meta meditation. And we can see that there are positive effects here, both in the short term. So you meditate now for 20 minutes, you feel better right away, but also in the long term, 
where people who do more meditation tend to have better mental health outcomes in the long term. A great book with lots of evidence on the benefits, especially the long-term lasting benefits of meditation is Altered Traits by Daniel Goleman and Richard Davidson. And the best piece of advice I can give you for how to take up meditation when you're in a terrible negative state is to do whatever kind of meditation is most enjoyable for you. Don't feel like you have to force yourself to do you know, a difficult, torturous 30-minute meditation session. If you find it easier to do a nice, light, five-minute guided meditation session, do that because any little bit is better than none. Next, let's talk about biophilia or the benefits of simply being exposed to nature. This might at first sound almost too good to be true, but it is true. And again, there's lots of evidence for this. Merely being exposed to nature, meaning seeing natural sights, trees, rivers, whatever, and hearing nature sounds and smelling nature smells has very strong and measurable health benefits. The effects are so strong, in fact, that in some countries such as Japan and Korea, we're seeing a pioneering movement of actually having nature exposure and so-called forest baths as prescriptions. You might go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, what you need to do is you need to spend half an hour a day in the forest. It's that effective. A great book to feed yourself more evidence of this being true is called The Nature Fix by Florence Williams. And a key takeaway that you can implement is that there is a dose response, which means that a little bit of nature already helps and every step more nature you get helps more. So if the best you can do is go to a small local park and look at a tree for a few minutes, that is already doing you good. So these are the most effective, most evidence-based and easiest to implement things that I found that I can do to slowly chip away at a negative mental health state. And this is really what it comes down to. When you're in the depths of a depression, then like I said, everything feels pointless and you don't feel like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go for a run in nature and then meditate and then everything's gonna be fine. It feels like this is all pointless and I hate it and I don't wanna do it. But with overwhelming evidence, when you can see how much evidence there is that this actually works, you can trust that if you get yourself to do it, even in a small way, you are slowly chipping away at your problem and you will over time slowly get better. And for me, reading books, like the books I mentioned, is really helpful. And it's also helpful for me, this is one of the greatest things about podcasts, if you don't want to listen to a book or read a book, you can listen to someone having a conversation about this. You're kind of just listening in on a conversation and picking up these ideas and piling on more and more evidence that these things can actually work. And let me also add to this. It's been a while since I made the first video in this series. And like I've said all along, the idea here is that I am documenting my own process. And it's not just about talking about some theory. And I can tell you that the difference between then and now is immense. So there's one more piece of evidence that this actually works because my state now is so much better than it was a few months ago. I feel completely different now. I feel so much more alive now and I have so much more of a positive outlook now. So once again, it's evidence that everything I've talked about here actually works. So in conclusion, I encourage you to try this out for yourself and see if you respond to evidence the way I do, where it makes it easier to be motivated to do things that will help you feel better. So I encourage you to check out the books I recommended, maybe find some podcasts to listen to with authors from those books or just people who talk about related topics and find some way to do some of these things that feels easy and small and doable for you because every little step helps. And also for a deeper dive into one of these topics, the biophilia effect, you can check out a link below to a part in the Ikario community, where there's a longer presentation on that and a community discussion. 
I promise you, this is wilder than you think it is. The stuff going on in this area and the effects that nature exposure has on humans is something that I think most of us completely underestimate. So if you're interested in learning more about that through a simple presentation that you can watch in our community and talk about it with other Ikario community members, check out the link below where you can join. Also check out this related video where I show how you can use light exposure to deal with seasonal affective disorder and simply have fewer of the winter blues. And in this video, I want to share with you the experiment I did and what worked for me. And I'll show you why this light bulb played a crucial role. <laughs>